out this time. All right, hi everyone. Um, I decided this week in Python Club we're going to do uh, not back to basics because we had done seven sessions and I was a little bit bored of it. Um, there's a lot of basics that we haven't covered, um, so instead we'll just cover that in future sessions. And there was uh, a lot of stuff like graph theory that we only you only scratched the surface of. So in future we'll come back to that. But uh, for this set of sessions, I was thinking we could do um, something based on actual lab data and analyzing real lab data and designing experiments. And um, it will be a nice opportunity to show how uh, how useful it can be to automate the analysis of your experiments. And not only that, but then use Python to design some potentially more insightful um, experiments. Um, so with that in mind, I'll show you uh, the notebook that we started up. So um, it's based on, I'll tell you what, it's, ba it's based on um, LB, which is like a, a growth media for E. coli primarily. Um, and it's got, what did I say, it's got in uh, yeast extract, which is like marmite, some salt, and something called tryptone, which is like a mix of peptides um, and I thought for this set of uh, sessions it would be cool to uh, find out number one whether or not this broth is actually optimal and then number two use it as an excuse to sort of look at some optimization techniques so the experiment I was doing was in uh, these 96 well plates where each well has either uh, some media all by itself or some uh, media with bacteria in and the way the experiment went was I would incubate it overnight in a plate reader a measurement machine and every 15 minutes or so it would measure how cloudy the, um, the solution was because when bacteria grows it goes from being uh, clear like this to cloudy like this so the absorbance at certain wavelengths um, increases so in this case it's fairly standard to use the absorbance at 600 nanometers so that's what we were looking at so i decided that for um, an initial experiment um, i'd do um, a pilot study where it's more a case of uh, having a go with the experiment, seeing if there are any like bugs or issues with it um, so I can do it maybe slightly better next time. Um, so the experiment that I did was with uh, just LB and just one type of cells um, and I'm growing for about 12 hours. It took me uh, two attempts to do it. Uh, the first time I, I managed to uh, get one of these plates uh, sort of stuck inside the machine because uh, I hadn't I hadn't moved the uh, sensor far enough from the from the plate itself. Um, so the output number that we're looking for for um, each of these wells is the growth rate, and we'll eventually be calculating the growth rate using the Gomper's equations. Um, which are loosely, well, which are based more or less around this equation here, where t is time and the function of time is sort of uh, the population or uh, a proxy to the population, in our case, the, the cloudiness. So, for example, um, it might create a curve a little bit like this. Um, so, yeah, a sigmoidal S shaped curve. And the number that we're interested in is the maximum growth rate. So that's the uh, gradient of the line at the steepest point. So throughout our optimizations, that's the number that we'll be trying to make an optimal recipe media for. So it would be a case of adjusting the parameters of the different ingredients in the media, sort of adjusting the recipe, if you like, so that we can get a higher score for growth rate or maximum growth rate as possible. Um, so for this first session, I've done this pilot study and it's uh, not only an opportunity for me to sort of find out the issues with the physical experiment itself, 
but also to make some functions that will automate the analysis of the experiment, which is one of the main things that I end up using Python for um, in the lab. Um, and it's one of those things where you only have to do it once and then from then on, the analysis just happens almost instantaneous, instantaneously. Okay, let's have a little look at this protocol. So um, the experiment runs in these 96 well plates. Uh, I'd tip it more in your favor, but at that point, the contents of the wells would spill all over the desk. Um, and in each one of those wells is uh, 200 microliters of the LB growth media. And the cells that I was using are fairly standard DH5 alpha strain of E. coli. So what I'll be doing with this is I'll be growing uh, some of this E. coli in a different tube throughout the day, ready to go for the experiment. Um, I'll take a sterile plate and put in uh, media into each well and then add uh, media with a tiny bit of cells in or seeded with cells into the test wells. And then throughout the course of measurement, uh, the plate reader, the measurement device that is, uh, has a built-in incubator. So um, yeah, the, the plate can sort of incubate and then move it to a measurement um, part of the machines, you know, take measurements and so on and do that every 15 minutes for about 12 hours. Uh, I can't remember what rate it was shaking at, um, but I can check later and I'll put that in. And then the data that comes out is a .csv file. Uh, the format of the CSV file is a little bit funny. So, I mean, if we follow this link, we should download it to uh, your computer if you execute these cells. Yeah, here we go. So here's what the raw file looks like. Um, and all of this stuff at the top here is stuff that's not directly relevant to the experiment. But at any rate, if you execute these cells, it will do a bash command. And you can tell it's a bash command on account of the... Uh, exclamation here that will download this file to whatever folder we're operating this notebook from. So I'll execute that. And then it brings us on to our first exercise. So our first exercise is to write a function that again automates the analysis for uh, downstream use. And I'll show you uh, I'll show you what I mean by dropping the first section of the file by uh, showing you the file itself. You got read CSV. Okay, so the first few rows of the file aren't actually the data itself. And you'll notice that there's loads of uh, not a number items in all of these cells. And the actual data starts at maybe about uh, line seven, let's say. Let's try that. Yeah, from about line seven or six or something like that downwards, then the data becomes an actual table which contains the data that we're interested in. So part one of this exercise is to drop that first section of the file that isn't actually useful to us. Um, then part two of the exercise is to set the well numbers as the index, the well numbers being the sort of uh, coordinates that refer to each one in the plate, A1, B1, and so on. And you'll find these in the first column right here. So we want to set these as the index. Part three of the exercise is to yeah, there'll, there'll, there'll be a couple of columns that aren't actually that useful to us. Uh, there'll be this column and this column. So once once uh, this is set as the index, we no longer need that. And we don't need this column either. So part three will be to get rid of those columns. And then part four is to set the time, the timestamps, uh, as the header. So let's have a look at that. So on row six, there's... Uh, the timestamps for each measurement and that needs to be the header of the data frame. Um, so mostly, well, almost entirely this uses pandas. 
um, which hopefully we've covered before. Yeah, which we, which we have covered before. Um, but I've left little clues in the, in the text box here um, for just in case, and I will go over the answers in five minutes. And in the meantime, I will take up or readdress my classic art uh, renditions. Uh, first of all, I'll show you. So I colored in one of the ones from last time, the girl with the pearl earring. And this time we're gonna be doing the Night Cafe by Vincent van Gogh for fun.
25 seconds left. How's everyone doing with that? I think I might have to come back to this. Okay. So. Okay, so uh, a review of the aims of the exercise. Drop the first section of the file, uh, which contains the information that we're not necessarily interested in, at least for this particular part of the analysis. Um, so I'm going to make a variable inside the function that is um, pd.read csv of the path that we're passing through. And then df is going to be the variable that I'm going to be working with uh, throughout the development of the function. df, because it's fairly easy to type, uh, the two keys are next to each other. OK, so now that the function returns a data frame, let's have it return a data frame that doesn't have the unnecessary um, metadata at the top. So one thing that we could do um, within this function is the drop NA. Um, drop NA will drop any rows that contain an NAN, which as luck would have it, most of the rows that we want to drop do. But let's run that and see if there are any issues. Well, the issue is that uh, the row above, uh, or sorry, the uh, row six, which has been excluded here, the rows that contain the timestamps, uh, that's been dropped as well because that contained a uh, NA value in as well. So instead, I'm going to do dot I lock. So for um, slicing a chunk out of the data frame, I've, I've got a choice of functions, either lock for locate or I lock for integer locate. And for this one, I'm going to use integer locate where I can locate part of the data frame based on the, the number of the rows or columns as opposed to the actual names of the rows or columns. Um, and in this case, I could, I could use either because the row names will be the same as the actual integers, sorry, the actual indices. Um, so yeah, look, I'm just going to go with that for now and go for row six onwards and all columns. Okay, so now that returns me a data frame that does include row number six, which contains the timestamps that I'll need later on. And for the meantime, I'll move on to the next the next step. Set the well numbers as the index. So the well numbers are here, AO1, AO2, and so on. Um, so if I want to locate the well numbers, uh, again, I've got a choice of using either iLock for index locate or just regular locate. So if I was using regular locate, the uh, rows field would be a colon to include all of them. And the columns field would be user colon space user all in capitals, maybe that works. Here we go. Um, so whatever way you choose to um, yeah, whatever whatever way you choose to access this column, um, so long as you actually do manage to do that, then yeah, there's no problem. Okay, so now we'll get to setting the index, um, which we can do with df.index which is the index attribute. And we can just overwrite that with our new selection by setting that as equal to this column that we've selected. Here we go. So now the index up here is uh, equal to this column next to it that we've uh, selected. That's good. OK. Drop the columns containing NAN and time so I think um, I was referring to these two columns. Sorry for not being very clear on that one. Um, so we no longer need the well numbers because that's already set as our index. 
and we didn't really have much of a use for sample X1, sample X2 and so on because we're identifying our whales based on their position rather than what sample number they are. So in this row I can do df is equal to df dot drop. Um, what does drop do? Drop is like the opposite of the locate function in that it will locate everything apart from what you want to drop. So by default, it will um, drop rows, like for example, A01. If I tell it to drop A01, then sure enough, uh, there's no A01. Um, but if I want it to drop this user user column, uh, then I'm gonna have to set axis is equal to one. I'm gonna have to set it to axis is equal to one. Um, just so that the program knows that it's uh, columns that we actually want to get rid of. If I want to get rid of multiple columns, then as the first argument to df.drop, I can pass it a list of column names or row names if you really want, and I want it to drop. Let's see how that goes. Okay, what's happened here? So I'd imagine what's happened is that the uh, backslashes, which are escape characters, are causing problems. So in that case, in that case then I will settle for just one column being dropped for now. And maybe a simple way around it would be to set a new index. This is probably not the optimal solution, but to skip ahead to the next part to set the timestamps as the as the column headers, and then I could go back and get rid of the hopefully less problematically named time column. So let's do that. Df dot columns so that's the attribute that I will be setting or resetting and I'll be wanting it to set to set it as the first row so I could either access it as by locating df dot lock nan as the row and all columns this might cause problems because I don't think that the NAN, in terms of what how it's represented in the computer, is actually represented as a string. I think it's being represented as a NumPy NAN. There you go, it was. Um, so, yeah, if you ever want to access or use um, an NAN value for whatever reason, and just know that the NAN that Pandas relies on is the NumPy NAN here. So that's one way I could have done it. The other way I could have done it is by using the integer locate, df.columns is equal to df.iloc, index locate. I keep on saying integer locate, I'm sorry about that. Um, but I mean index locate. And I'm locating the zero throw and all the columns. So zero and a colon for all the columns. And there we go. Ah, no, not there we go. That hasn't worked. Why hasn't it? Hmm. Okay, live debugging. Let's go. So 
So the data frame we have, as it's zero throw, yeah, that should be that should be this row. So if I try and return that, yeah, okay, here we go. That makes sense. So that's the timestamps that we're after. So the zero throw should be right. Pandas doesn't allow columns to be created via a new attribute. Hmm. Okay then. Well, in that case, I'm just going to. Oh Christ! What have I done? Hmm. So it seems like I've got myself into a bit of a, a bit of a sticky situation here. So I'm going to refer back to the answers that I wrote earlier. So what do I do here? Uh, I locate the sixth row. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. So I locate it from six onwards. So I do that there. That's cool. And then I set the columns as the sixth row onwards. Okay, let's let's see what that gives us. So it looks like I'm doing it in a different different order than before. So you'll notice that the first row in this data frame is actually labeled number six. So this is where discrepancies between locate and I locate will arise. Oh, what a bummer. Okay, so, so something in the function I wrote earlier does work as opposed to the answer I tried to improvise just now. But what was it? So I located the data frame by row six onwards to trim out the stuff that we didn't want. And this is one of the places where we were having problems. Let's comment out everything else. But why? Hmm. Okay. You know what? We'll move on. Uh, apologies for the lack of clarity. Uh, as always, the answers are in this file here, which you can check out in your browser. And the answers have been imported here in this file, design of experiments answers. And we create this uh, data frame using the answer function, which I just pasted in the cell above. And we have a look at it and we can see that we have the timestamps in the top column. That's good. Okay. All right, problem number two. So before we plot this, we're going to need to address the uh, timestamps in the top column and how they are strings as opposed to uh, actual numbers. So like how we did in the UVVIS data analysis tutorial, we're going to use um, the regex function, which is short for regular expression, and essentially it's a string searching uh, module. Uh, and we're going to use find all to find all occurrences of, well, numbers in our case in each string in the columns. And then that should return us a list of either one or two values. Um, in the case of whole hours, like for example, zero hours or one hours, the list will be one item long. And in the case of 
other timestamps, it'll be it'll be two items long. So the aim of this exercise is to uh, use the regex function re dot find all um, with. Mm, okay, uh, so I guess I guess the, this is this is the clue. Uh, this is the matching pattern that you'll be wanting to use in the regex find all backslash d plus. So a single backslash d will match a single uh, numerical character string, and backslash d plus will match multiple of them, uh, which is good if you're dealing with uh, two or more digit numbers, which we are. So that's the search time that you'll be wanting to use here. And then string will be each of the yeah, it'll be the string will be each of the uh, column headers. So I suppose you'll be wanting to loop through, and then from that, that will return a list, and then you'll be wanting to extract the hours and the minutes, the second item in the list. And then once you have that, it gets much easier. It's a case of calculating the numbers of number of hours by sixty to, and then adding it to the number of minutes for total number of minutes. And that's it, that's all we want from the function. I'll give you another five minutes timer about that. If you have any questions, then please, please shout. And then I'll go through this again in five minutes.
Okay, I'll start going through the exercise now because admittedly I didn't give you very much help with this, especially if uh, you didn't follow the UV Viz tutorial which had info on how to use Regex. Also, I think this link is a dead link, um, which I will work on fixing later on. I mean, it takes you somewhere, but at least in my, my case, I can't get the file to load. So I'll start going through the answers anyway. So I'm going to get rid of this pass statement down at the bottom there. Pass is just something that I include in partially built functions or objects or whatever, only so that it doesn't throw a syntax error. Okay. I'm going to put a return statement at the bottom and I'm going to call the object that we're working with x because why not? So x will be the result of this regex search of the headers that will go into this function. Um, the search string that we want to put in is backslash d plus, like I mentioned earlier. So that's a multi-digit number. And for now, let's just put in headers zero, the first, the first header. Yeah, ah, okay, I'll tell you why I'm getting this error. It's because my runtime was disconnected. And as a result, I lost all my variables. So I just ran all of the cells again. Now I have the variables. And you can see that when I run this uh, regex on the first item of the headers, then I get zero. Uh, on the second item, I get zero hours and 15 minutes and so on. You can, you can imagine how it goes, seven hours and 30. So to apply this regex to all of the headers, um, I can do a for loop, which short of doing a list comprehension, I will create a list, a new list, You know, actually, I'm going to call the new list X. And then I'll start iterating through headers for item in headers. Um, then I'll be wanting to perform the search with regex dot find all backslash D plus uh, item. Um, but I need to catch that variable in the list x. So I'm going to add x dot append. The results of this search. So now when I run it, you'll see I have a list of lists. That's workable. That's that's somewhere. Well, at least I mean, we're getting somewhere. Um, but we do have a problem with different length lists. So I'm going to put in uh, another loop, I think. So we're going to loop through x. And I suppose we want to return the number of minutes in each other. OK, let's do that. For item in x. So now when we're iterating through we'll each item will be a list of length either one or two um, so let's say if length of the item is equal to two then the number of minutes will be equal to the zero item in the list on a zero, uh, which of course is a string, so we'll need to turn that into an integer. Okay, uh, times 60 plus the integer of the the next item in the list uh, located by one. And then else 
the number of mins will be equal to just this part. Okay, that sounds good. So, so in each case, we'll have the number of minutes. Um, and we'll make a new variable. Let's call it mins and create that as an empty list. And then outside of the if statement, so either way, we'll have, or we should have an item called num mins. So let's append that to mins.append. And then have the function return mins. Here we go. So now that is the number of minutes in uh, extracted from each of their column headers in each one. So that was with a conventional for loop, which is much easier, in, or at least easier to read and write in some cases than uh, the alternative, which is to uh, do it in terms of list comprehensions. And if you're interested in uh, list comprehensions, then take a look at the answers where I've got a list comprehension with an if else statement, which was, uh, admittedly, I had to look up how to do that before I before I did it. But yeah, there we go. There's, there's how you do it in there. Okay. So now we have, um, we can set the uh, column headers of the data frame as the integers of each uh, of each timestamp. So I'm importing the pretty much the same function um, into into the program in the answers. But let's go. Well, I've already run it now, I suppose. Okay, so now we have the number of minutes, uh, the column headers, the well numbers as the uh, index, and the absorbents at 600 nanometers as all of the values in the cells. Okay. Um, yeah, let's have a quick look at the data and then we'll start winding up the tutorial um, and come back to the rest of it in next week. But when we run, or when we try and plot it, let's run this uh, bit of code here. Okay, so to get this to work, import matplotlib.pyplot. Sorry I didn't include that in uh, your own notebooks um, as PLT, the alias PLT. Um, so in order to get any plotting to work, you'll need to make sure that you've imported matplotlib.pyplot and as plt, the convention. Okay, so when we run that, that looks horrible and that's definitely not what it's supposed to look like. Um, reason for that being is that this particular row uh, isn't, actually, isn't actually numbers. If you scroll to the bottom, it says the data type is object, which normally means it's either a mixed type or it's a string. And in this case, it's a string, which is why the plot has come out so funny. So in that case, I'm going to run df dot as type float, and what that should do is return a copy of the date frame in which. Uh, every item inside the data frame is now a float. So now when I run the uh, same command again, we get something that looks a little bit more sensible as a graph. So that's a quick overview of the default, uh, the D type problem. Okay, we'll, we'll call this the one last exercise for today and then we'll do the rest uh, next week. So. Um, yeah, let's let's put some data from the plate. So the exercise here is using uh, matplotlib, uh, make a reusable function for quickly plotting the uh, data. So it doesn't have to be perfect, but we want to have a wide canvas, which you can do by uh, prepending uh, all of the plotting uh, functions within your function with plt.figure and then set the figure size to x and y. Um, and then plot the entire data frame fed to that function 
with a loop that sort of loops through the index of the data frame, locates each row by that index, and then plots it. And then optionally, you can add aesthetic changes, like for example, adding a label or adding a legend. I'll give you another five minutes for that. Okay, let's go. Uh, Ying Ying says 200 RPM should be fine for shaking the plate in the incubator. Um, I'll double check what I did, but yeah, that doesn't sound too far off why I actually did do. How are you doing? Awesome. Did you go to Yespa? Yeah. Did you go to Yespa? Did I go to Yespa? Yeah. What? Yesterday. Oh, yeah. I did. How was it?
Okay. So, the... Thank you. So, the function that we had to do was to have the function take in a data frame, like for example, this slice in the testing row at the bottom of the cell here, and then build a plot where every row or every sort of, I was gonna say trace, but every every well at the different time points is plotted. So let's go through the items one by one. Set a wide canvas, plt.figure, with the parameter fig size is equal to, and you feed it a tuple of what I think is x and y, 10 and 5, 10 across and 5 now. Sounds okay to me. But if it comes out a funny shape, then we'll know that I got the numbers in the wrong order and I have to switch them back down again. And now to plot the entire data frame. So within the function, the data frame is called data. So let's loop through its index, 4i in data dot index. Uh, the row that we're interested in will be data dot lock. That's just with regular locate because we're locating through the index names, i, the row, and all columns of that row. Then we'll want to be plotting that, plt dot plot row. Okay, sounds good to me. Uh, PLT dot show at the end uh, for now, and we'll see what that looks like. Okay, that looks that looks kind of sensible. Um, I suppose we'll be wanting to add PLT dot x label for the x label. Uh, that's time in minutes. PLT dot y label is the O. D six hundred. I think that will pretty much do us for now. Uh, one thing we could do is, as we plot within the plot function, we could feed matplotlib a label name for the trace, which in this case would be the well number, which is also the index that we set earlier. Um, and as we do that, we can set a turn on the legend which will automatically detect what the label name for each plot or each line is and show it to us. So it'll be quite a big legend because we've got um, 24 different uh, traces in there but that's it all plotting. Okay we'll call, we'll call that it for today's session. Um, if, if you're keen then um, feel free to go through uh, exercise 1.4 where we uh, baseline each trace based on its absorbance at T0. And next time we will be applying the uh, growth equation that we looked at earlier to get a growth rate for each well. And then we'll design the next round of experiments that uh, we will have be ready to automatically um, analyze with the functions that we've built today. Uh, that's all I've got for today. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, whilst I'm at it, I made a... Yeah, I've been slowly putting together uh, a, a website for Python Club. Website might be a slightly generous term for it. It's pretty much the README from the GitHub in a slightly nicer format. I'll put the link for it up on the Python Club channel later on if you're interested in looking. Um, and then at some point I'll have links to videos and so on. All right then. Uh, that's all I've got for today. Uh, and I'll see you next time. Thank Bye, you. Everyone. Bye.